Hey everyone, time to kick off another exciting edition of our DevOps Office Hours. It's September 6th, 2023. My name's Eric Osterman and I'll be your host. I'm the founder and CEO of Cloud Posse. Cloud Posse helps teams conquer AWS using our rock solid Terraform blueprints. Whether you're starting from scratch or just not satisfied with your current setup, book a session with me directly by going to cloudposse.com slash quiz, answer a few quick questions, and we'll have a call to show exactly how your team will succeed. For those of you new to the call, the format is very informal. My goal is to get your questions answered. If you're curious about Cloud Posse or any of our awesome open source tools and projects, this is a great place to ask. For those of you joining from our podcast or YouTube channel, you can register for these live and interactive sessions by heading to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, cloudposse.com slash office hours. We host these calls every week, so don't miss out. Our call today is recorded. We'll post a recording of this session to our YouTube channel. If you want to support what we do over here, please hit those like and subscribe buttons. It helps us out a great deal. Just head over to youtube.com slash cloud posse. Again, youtube.com slash cloud posse. Also, if you found something interesting uh, on today's session, it's a great place to find that video so you can share it with the rest of your team to keep everyone on the same page. And with that said, let's uh, get into some announcements here. So the first one is uh, a small one, um, Amazon add support for uh, vended control plane logs. Uh, I know it's been raised by other customers um, that they didn't find the logs that they wanted, but I'm not 100% sure um, if this is it. Were all of these logs uh, available through the EKS control plane and now you can subscribe to individual ones directly? I think I think the, the difference is they were, they were available to be sent to CloudWatch logs before, but now they're when they're tagged as vended, they you get like a discount on sending that volume uh -huh. um, to to CloudWatch because they have like a different um, a different pricing. It's um, kind of like so. I mean, otherwise Amazon is kind of like their own ATM machine, just like generate yeah. more logs to generate more money. So they're doing yeah, that. Yeah. That's fair. So they. They tag, I think it says there, like now you can see on in the second paragraph that it's it's all the API service logs, the audit log, IAM authenticator log, like all those things are now being published there. And um, yeah, and there you go. That now there's a there's a special price for that. I don't remember the details of how much less it is. I just remember that you get some sort of volume discount for it. Um, Vlad, can you talk more about vended logs? Anything you know about? Yeah, this is purely a pricing change. So if you're sending a bunch of logs, uh, Eric, if you scroll down a bit, yeah. So you can see here that there are volume discounts available and people are were very excited that the noisy and very specific EKS logs are now going to be able to take advantage of these discounts. It's a pricing change, as far as I understand it. Okay. Yeah. So if you scroll, if you scroll back up, so this one's fifty cents a gig. If you scroll back up to the normal pricing, mm -hmm. I think it's oh right oh it's no right 50, there. it's fifty cents a gig if it's normal, and if you are doing vendor logs, you get discounts down to what's the official one, uh, five That's cents five a gig. Cents. Yeah. Once you're doing terabytes. <laughs> Yeah, I think the data stored is is different too. Like I think it's the three cents. It's like three cents for that data stored per gig. And if you scroll back up, I think it's higher on the, the other one. Oh no, I guess not. I don't know. Hmm. Don't know. Maybe it's only when you get to the volumes, the higher volumes that you get significant discounts. Yeah, I'm also not very up to date with the pricing, so I cannot. Yeah, <laughs> I, for sure, but I, 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 know I don't pay the bills. <laughs> I don't know what we do. Yeah, that's the same way. I don't pay any AWS bills, or the ones I I pay are a couple hundred bucks a month. Uh, so I don't really, uh, yeah. I don't, I don't really pay too much attention to it. <laughs> um, here was a, just a small little 
uh, thing that uh, came across my news feed. It, it, it didn't change any time recently. This is not, you know, obviously in response to anything that has recently happened uh, with projects adopting Boosel, but it shows how Boosel can uh, suppress distribution by certain popular um, operating systems like Fedora. Yeah, I think there what they're doing is they're just making sure that any any contributions that have like um, to the to Fedora itself that have any like downstream dependencies, it's making sure that none of those downstream dependencies are distributed under Buso because the overall um, Fedora is uh, distributed under MIT. So I think they're just being careful that they don't accidentally embed something that it has this commercial poison pill as we've been calling it recently uh, under the hood. This is, so this is interesting. I haven't looked closer at this. Um, how are they? It looks like they have. Is this a standard schema format that they've come up? It, that they is this a custom schema format that they've come up with, or is this like some open source tooling? And is this something that projects can adopt uh, themselves to ensure by you know license compatibility? Yeah, I think this this whole this whole. Um uh project is called fedora license data so i'm assuming that that's like their own tooling to make sure that 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 happens that's cool but i don't know how it works under the hood i just know that i read i read that that's what it seems to be doing yeah well uh for all you old farts out there that have been on aws for a little while uh, myself included. This is where I got my start. It was it 2005 or something? There were only, uh, uh, was it M1 Smalls at the time? Um, and we tried to build our startup on it. Let's just say that uh, Amazon still exists, but that startup did not. <laughs> uh, there were no Amazon load balancers or anything else. Anyways, EC2 Classics, these were the EC2 instances that were not deployed in a VPC because they predated VPCs. Uh, due to Amazon's early or initial success, still a lot of enterprises had adopted these. We have a customer uh, that had some legacy accounts somewhere. They just finally got off of uh, EC2 Classics as well in advance of the deadline. But that's the end of an era. This is what started the public cloud, if you ask me. Any other tributes to EC2 Classic? All right. Um, <clears throat> something uh, clickbait worthy. I don't know. I, I tried my luck at it. And uh, yeah, I suck at Amazon icons. I wonder how everyone else does. They, they've they got, as Amazon just adds and adds to the cheesecake menu of cloud services, it's so hard to interpret all of these icons other than the ones we interact with uh, every single day. All right. Who, who knows this one? What is this? My guess would be SWF, but I don't know. It's Lambda, but it's the really old icon that has been deprecated for forever. Oh, really? Okay. All right. That was the right answer. All right. Uh, let's see. What else? I was really excited about this one. Uh, we're doing a lot with Markdown at Cloud Posse uh, on GitHub, so GitHub flavored Markdown. Um, they're really useful for GitHub action and job summaries. In addition to obviously, you know, everyone uses Markdown for readmes, right? But uh, GitHub has also added the ability uh, to produce job summaries if you're using GitHub actions. So uh, anything you can do to help enrich those summaries is beneficial. That's why I'm really happy about this. If you're using Docusaurus or any of the other popular static site documentation systems, they have this concept of an admonition. Um, now GitHub has that too. Uh, they haven't, this is in beta. They haven't committed to the syntax yet. It is subject to change. To use, for example, a note, you have to use exactly this format. It has to be uh, a what do you call it? A quote uh, or a citation reference here, and then uh, star star note star star, and then you get an admonition that looks like this. Yeah. 
next uh i came across this um uh, newsletter randomly uh this past week um what i liked about it is uh it seems heavily curated uh lots of projects aws centric uh related to open source lots of content so if you're Thirsty for more open source projects and things going on in AWS. That looked interesting to me. And uh, one of the biggest criticisms um, of OpenTF is, you know, uh, where's the fork, WTF? Uh, and now uh, we have that fork. Uh, so this has been uh, uh, in progress for several weeks now um, due to legal reasons. It wasn't yet made public. Now it is made public. The name OpenTF, you know, subject uh, to change. And um, there's ongoing discussions around that name and uh, some legal concerns as well. But if you, uh, but for, for transparency's sake, it is public now. Uh, you can open issues here um, uh, with suggestions. All right. And next uh, is uh, the OpenTF um, project made the uh, technology radar for O'Reilly, uh, along with uh, obviously many other uh, projects as well. All right, there was some uh, huge snafu with Zoom. Was it this week, Matt? Were you the one telling me about that? I think I think it was a couple of weeks ago, like the beginning of August, maybe. Something like that, uh, or, yeah. or the beginning, middle of August. Yeah, they basically said all your data on Zoom belongs to us. Yeah, any, any, they said any audio, video, or uh, visual graphics that you uh, shared via Zoom were the uh, sole property of Zoom, and they could use it for any purpose that that they wanted, uh, anything that was legal, basically, <laughs> and. Uh, everyone like threw up their hands and screamed about it and they backed off of the license. But um, I don't know if they now have, oh, there it still says that they, they backed down, but are they going to come back again with some, some other version of that? It's really interesting because it, yeah, I just suspected it was because they wanted to uh, start doing AI and with AI, you really have no way of coordinating that data off um correctly so yeah. i guess that was why i wonder what this does to their plans hopefully someone writes a tighter license like i think most people i mean the problem with zoom is is that you are often talking on internal you know internally and sharing proprietary information and ideas right. and all those kind of things and if you're training learning models with those things, especially things that may not be uh, out in the wild yet. You're, it's kind of a, it's a slippery slope um, for intellectual property. Yeah, I can understand why business would be skittish. As an end user, I would just love to be able to go to Zoom and you know ask questions of a conversation uh, or even especially uh, meetings I wasn't able to attend, um, yeah. things like that. I mean, that's the, the scary part, though, is if you ask it a question or, you know, some competitor of yours asks it a question and it answers yeah. with, you know, Eric's super secret strategy for taking over the world is, <laughs> is the best way to approach this, you know, and uh, uh, and then you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's actually even worse. There are bots that can do that for you, but they are often blocked in companies. Because the second you have that bot, that becomes official company product. So every single meeting and every single conversation had by anybody can now be subpoenaed. Mm. <laughs> that is something that a lot of people do not want. And those types of bots were very, very, very early blocked and a whole spew of startups got instantly dead. Brave new world. All right. Um, another exciting announcement, and I see we have none other than the uh, Pepe Amengual here, aka uh, Jose. Um, so, Pepe, you want to tell us about what's going on with Atlantis? Sure. Yeah. Uh, pretty uh, exciting announcement. We are pretty happy that actually we we end up here. We we actually tried to do this before, but 
uh, Luke and HashiCorp were not um, willing to move the project to CNCF. And then um, uh, RB, thanks to his um, relentless uh, <laughs> idea, he created an issue and basically just, you know, forced Luke and HashiCorp to like, please give us an, an official answer so we can put this to rest if the answer is no. But uh, we got a pretty good surprise. And so they allow us to to actually commit it to the uh, CNCF. So uh, we created the the issue to, uh, to to start as a sandbox. Most probably we are not going to be a sandbox project. We will be incubated right away, but there is a lot of work to do to get there. Um, yeah, and so that's that's how it, it kind of happens. And uh, that's how we are here. So we are doing all the transferring and stuff. So, and Luke is going to back down to the project. So. Mm -hmm. uh, the owners of uh, Atlantis would be basically a CLCF and we, we, we will become the, the maintainers from now on. That's so cool, yeah. Pepe. Yeah, you've been following this project for a long time and uh, yes. <laughs> kind of uh, been promoted and risen through the ranks uh, to become a maintainer. It's exciting for me to see you do that. Also, RB. Uh, so fun fact, uh, Pepe and RB were both at Cloud Posse at some point in time. So fun to see this, uh, you guys you know, taking charge of your own project. Uh, yeah, well, it's, a, it's, it's a full circle because the way I got it to Atlantis was because of a PR that was created by by you guys, uh, Andre, in, 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 and it was actually closed in, the, in Atlantis. And that's how I actually started on the Atlantis project. I started learning Go to try to actually bring that code into version 13 of Atlantis. Yeah. And then that when that got merged, then I, I made so much noise that I ended up, you know, Luke asked me, do you want to be a maintainer? I was like, sure. <laughs> and that's that's where everything started. So, yeah, so full circle. <laughs> yeah. It actually, not, not that I want to put Luke on the spot, but it probably puts Luke in, in a pretty bad position if it didn't go this way, because being employed by HashiCorp, uh, with their change in licensing models, yeah. if anyone were using... Atlantis in a production way that was deemed to be competing oh, with yeah. HashiCorp's cloud offerings, he would be in a weird spot being a HashiCorp employee and also maintaining that open source project. So this is probably best for the project <laughs> overall. Yeah. yeah, and and we did get uh, actually official approval from HashiCorp uh, as as uh, Atlantis not being part of you know not being uh, uh, against the the new license. So. That was a good thing, more than the GitHub comment. You got like an email or a letter or something. Or... It, well, the 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 GitHub comment is still the official answer. Oh, okay. I guess I guess we will get a, an official one after we move it to the CNCF. But yeah, yeah. But it seems and to be then, okay for now. <laughs> until until someone creates the you know hosted uh, hosted offering of this uh, and takes some money for it, and then then obviously. It competes, so <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. And also, to be clear, this would be a transfer, right? Not a fork. It would be a transfer, correct? Yeah, yeah. That's so cool. we, we sure. are going to become the owners very soon, maybe next week. So we will be the owners of the repo uh, from now on, and then oh, okay. we will so transfer it to the CCS. And then you can transfer correct. it. Correct. Okay. That's right. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, how can people help support you? Just you know, give us some thumbs up in the issue. That that's uh, that would be good. And um, you know, and once you know is moved to the CNCF, obviously you know start you know contributing to Atlantis. You know, there is a there has been a lot of conversations in the past about some companies not willing to use Atlantis because of the relationship with HashiCorp two and all that. And um, this actually, I think, will help Atlantis in the long run as as building a a, a more a structure. Uh, community community so that's why we are really excited about it. that's very cool also maybe cncf can help sponsor your slack community as well yeah the, there's a bunch of other things that you get from from them which is which is pretty cool um and we're you know eager to you know be uh, graduated but uh there's a lot of work to do I, I have been going through the documentation and all that and there is a, a lot of things that we need to get done before we get there but yeah any questions for pepe 
was HashiCorp still allocating any effort to Atlantis or was it just a community project? I know Luke hasn't been working on it for a while. Yeah, Luke, Luke hasn't been, I mean, if you look at the history, there's, he hasn't been committing code for, I don't know, four years or so. So, um, and, and, and HashiCorp has been allowing the facilitation of, you know, creating maintainers groups and all that kind of stuff. So, um, they had been very, you know, hands off from anything. They they don't even get involved. I mean, the only thing that we 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 all only got was a Zoom link. You know, is it, they never got involved in conversations or decisions about adding features or anything like that. So we 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 actually had a lot of freedom to do whatever uh, we wanted or merge whatever we wanted. Um, I certainly merge few regressions so you know um <laughs> but anyhow um <laughs> the happens. It, it happens it happens so um we never actually i never if you ask me personally i never thought that hashiko was like on top of looking at me like a you know like a dark cloud and no n- nothing like that so but but certainly because of the license change and all that there is a certain um feeling or karma associated to it i guess so I think I'm moving over makes it a, a clear separation of concerns, I guess. So, so I think it's better anyways. Vlad brings up a good point that uh, a security review of Atlantis would make a lot of folks feel more, more comfortable with it. And the CNCF usually pays for that, he said. Yes. And, and funny enough, one of the things that why we haven't actually released version one is because of the, call, the code QL reports we have, which can, oh. we can only see. Uh, and that we don't have time to work on it because we don't have enough contributors to actually make that work and, and actually clear all those up so that we can do release 1.1, 1. 1. 1.0. So, so what we hope to that it will happen is thanks to the support of the CNCF and all these tools, we will be able to actually work on this, uh, uh, on the security review, get it all figured out. And as soon as it's moved to the CNCF, we can release 1.0. Sweet. Any more questions for Pepe? All right. Next announcement is uh, a small one, but um, I thought it was kind of interesting. I think I noticed this before at some point um, that S3, when you queried uh, the endpoint for it, you'd only ever get one IP back. Uh, now Amazon will return up to eight IPs, so you can just you know smash the crap out of the S3 endpoint uh, if you need to. Um, and another project I came across uh, randomly, I hadn't heard of it before, uh, by Ergomake called Layerform. Um, another project to help manage Terraform environments, uh, targeting uh, more developers to create consistent environments um, with greater ease. I haven't looked at it personally, uh, but yeah, it's got a thousand stars. I think if this is the same project that I'm thinking of, and I might be conflating it with something else, but I think there's actually, um, they actually have checks in there so that if you if you try to modify any resource that's created by a lower layer in the stack, which I thought was pretty cool. And can you explain that again? I didn't follow. You get- so like, let's say you create like your VPC as a component and then um, and then right there, like on the, on the uh, diagram that's right there, you have your VPC, then Kubernetes, then you have your topic on top of it. Like, and then, so if anything in your Kubernetes like layer, if that were, if that were like defined as a layer and deployed separately, if anything in that tried to modify a resource that was deployed by your VPC layer, it actually like stops you from doing that. Mm. So that you can't basically mutate infrastructure that was created by something at a lower layer. Yeah, there it is, the layer immu- immutability and layer rebasing thing. Hmm. I thought this was the project. I, I read it a while ago, but I haven't I haven't actually done this. I've only read it, but it it does something with the plan to see if um, if you're like mutating resources that you shouldn't be, basically.
That's cool. I and do that, like and that way you, you can give more like you can give more freedoms to people without having to rely solely on I am permissions um, for things like in this case, like there's a, a built in check to make sure that you're not mutating resources that you shouldn't be. All right. Let's see any more announcements. Nope. That was the last Vlad, one. Vlad actually posted a couple. Oh, he, he just, he just reposted <laughs> in the channel. I was going to, I was going to point you to what he just reposted. Let's see here. Yeah. These were just two new announcements from GitHub to their public roadmap. So they cannot be used now. They're not a thing. But they're gonna be a thing potentially maybe sometime in the future. Uh, this is just um, what was this one? Oh yeah, controlling outbound network access from uh, GitHub hosted runners. So this is gonna make a lot of people very happy because right now That's if good. you wanna control stuff, you need to run your own runners and in your own VPC, and you can do whatever you want there. But this is gonna be way easier. Yeah, now just try to get a comprehensive list of all the AWS uh, endpoints. <laughs> Hopefully it comes with a UI to click, 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 allow, allow, allow. Because otherwise, yeah, this is going to be tedious. And the second one was interesting because that was uh, Copilot is getting a reference check, which is basically, hey, uh, Copilot suggested I think this is Copilot. Yeah, GitHub Copilot. So if GitHub Copilot suggests, hey, you should use this code, it's going to tell you, and we took it from this repository with this uh -huh. license, which is something that Amazon's Code Whisperer did have when it launched. So it was interesting to see this also coming to Copilot. How, how does yeah. it, yeah, how does it know? Uh, I wonder if it, if it like, if it learned a pattern across like, many, many repositories where people are using that same kind of pattern. How does it know what to attribute that to, I wonder? It no. I'm speaking about Code Whisperer here, but it knows not for all code, but for some code. Like if it's a general pattern and it did enough changes and the sources yeah. are murky, it's not gonna tell you where it got it from. But if it's like, sure. hey, we pretty much copy pasted this part from this open source repository, yeah. we're also gonna show you the source, the license, whatever. It was, genuinely an awesome feature in code whisper because then you could look at the source and see like oh that's what they're doing or be like oh yeah this source is this super fancy report that i trust it's not vlad proof of concept 2018 yeah <laughs> <Bad>. <laughs> okay well let's uh anywhere any more announcements before we uh get going or also vlad had some additional ones i think above from aws um what were they? Oh, yeah, I did. Yes. I, I was so confused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're tiny. Uh, uh, they were in the Slack. Oh, that's where they were. Was, yeah. What was it? Oh, I got it. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, AWS SAM support for Terraform is now GA. It was in preview for a while. It's now generally available. It's pretty nice. Basically, if you're using uh, Anton's uh, serverless.tf modules or any other Terraform modules to uh, manage uh, Lambda functions, you can now use SAM with that. So you can do stuff like uh, local builds, local invokes, generating tests, uh, getting the logs locally while you're developing and using both the code and Terraform. It's a pretty nice integration. Yeah, before when when you would run like SAM deploy, it would just hook or uh, um, cloud uh, cloud formation, and it would basically build stuff with the cloud formation template. And now they're they're giving you the ability to just use your own Terraform module. I think that's kind of the TLDR to do that. Yep. Mm, that's cool. Yeah, it is because the Sam CLI is pretty nice. Like developers love it. Yeah, it's it's really good for local testing of uh, of lambdas that you're building. 
Okay. And this has been in preview for a while. They took all the feedback, like they really listened. It was lovely. Like props to the SAM team. And the other thingy that I passed, uh, that I pasted was the SES now tracks every single email, which is going to make a lot of people very happy and eliminate <laughs> a bunch of support tickets. And it's going to make a lot of privacy people very unhappy. <laughs> well, it tracks people in the sense that it shows you the data. They already had the data. Yeah. But now there's no more ticket to support to figure out what happened. It's just in the virtual de deliverability manager thingy. I know a lot of people were very, very, very excited about this release. Yeah, I saw I saw a lot of people excited about it. All right. Any more announcements that we can bring up today? from anyone? Okay, let's uh, go into Q&A. Uh, I think Matt Gowie had a question from last week, but I don't see Matt on the call. So maybe we'll punt on that until next week when he might be back. I have a question. Go for it, Ralph. How much of an effort do you think it would be to translate all the modules into Azure? I know there's no translation. I mean, it's all just uh, pure rewrite. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't say it's a pure rewrite. I think I could write a script that might replace certain commands of AWS into certain commands of Azure. I mean, the architectures for those, the architectures of the APIs and the underlying resources and all of the properties that you need to pass to them, et cetera, are like vastly different. Okay. Yeah. So so yeah. there is no easy. I've, way I've done some it. I've I've done some just to give you the and I'm not just saying that, I've actually done some um some work on this um where I built some Azure modules that are publicly available. Uh and like the way that you actually do it is just completely different. The Azure resource manager, the concept of of accounts doesn't really exist in Azure. It's like subscription IDs. It's like a whole, everything is just significantly different. And the resources themselves are named differently and have different properties and have different life cycles for applying them and making them work together. Some, some, of, those, some of those things are not problems, but when you say that the architecture is different, that is the only part that scares me. I think I think maybe you're you're thinking about and trying to digest this problem at much too high of a level if you've uh, if I, you haven't I, like gotten down and looked at the no, if you I haven't have looked at the APIs yet. Yeah, I think I when when you start to look, just to give you a quick example, like you know the Azure like Azure doesn't have an actual like a VPC that lines up the same exact way as like Amazon has a VPC. And the properties, the, the resource name is is completely different, right? So you have to underlying when you have resource AWS VPC, you're going to have like resource, whatever it is, Azure, Azure RM virtual network or whatever. But then from there, like you may be able to get to that level of substitution, but then from there, the property names, what they mean, how how you create storage groups, how you can create network firewall rules, how you do VPC peering, how you do dot 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 is completely different between so my the, only, the two clouds. So my, it, my it only experience really translate. my only experience with this is having uh, moved uh, Ops Cloud, which is a proprietary thing, from AWS to Azure, and we lost some of the functionality because Azure just was different. Well, then that's the key thing is that any sort of translation would have to assume the lowest common denominator. And when you do a lowest yeah. common denominator, yeah. Yeah. you lose the strategic advantages that each yes. cloud offers. Uh, yeah. So you, you might be able to solve it at a level, but you really don't win, get the outcome that was desired. So let me ask you a bigger question. Is it possible to be multi-cloud? Well, I think it means so many different things, and uh, there is a great video out there. So uh, we are we were multi-cloud in the sense that we had infrastructure running on different clouds, 
Yeah. But we weren't multi cloud in the strictest sense that we could send right. workloads to different clouds in an automated fashion. Right. Uh, and this is where I, too few companies uh, have, <laughs> the, uh, you know, the finances to support that, you know, pure multi cloud that you're talking about. And, and this is where Armin uh, talks about, you know, you don't choose, uh, you don't choose multi-cloud, multi-cloud chooses you. Um, <laughs> I like uh, that. It's, it's basically, you know, your, your company, you acquire other companies, those companies are operating in other clouds. Voila, you're multi-cloud. Uh, just, it's not a, it's not a strategy. It is. Uh... <laughs> I've ever only um, talked to one engineer. I, I could qualify playing... it as well. Oh, sorry. I've only ever talked to one engineer who claimed that they did multi-cloud. He worked for Twitter at the time. This was pre-pandemic. Probably doesn't have a job, but uh, anyway, sorry. <laughs> go go ahead. Oh, I, oh, I was just gonna I was gonna give a more concrete example from my experience. Um, I was working at a startup that did uh, video dialing for uh, folks who are deaf and mute, and in that process, if somebody's trying to do sign language and uh, the the signal at all, if the video goes under 30 frames per second, they become unintelligible to the other party. Ooh. So <clears throat> we actually deployed a lot of our different uh, Camilo uh, instances onto AWS, but um, we found that when we were doing transcoding, we had to actually put them um, closer to a stronger network. And uh, we found that actually the best network for keeping consistent video was on uh, GCP. So we ended up going to Google Compute for a lot of the different pieces that were uh, at risk of being bottlenecked. And we found that it was actually just a much cleaner network. And it's hard to describe how that works. It's just uh, the best way to say it is uh, when you when you try to make a conversation between Verizon and T-Mobile, uh, the hoops that they make you jump through with SIP, it just uh, it can be very sensitive to what uh, the trunks are that are going into the data centers. And so we literally, we found that it was night and day for the people. And they were like, yep, we can actually understand each other. So we were like, guess we're, we're using both. So for all you people who over the months have suggested uh, that I should quit my job to solve the issues that I brought <laughs> up here, I have to report that I am free now. I work for a small startup and I can actually accomplish what I want. Well, I can <laughs> I can unequivocally say if you work for a small startup, you should not even be thinking about multi-cloud. No, I'm and I'm this, this saying that question, seriously. <laughs> this question is left over from the last startup that I was in. Just to be clear, okay. <laughs> yeah. We are happy on GCP. We're not moving. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've um, uh, the only experience I have is um, I'll just say like I, I've done some work with um, probably one of the top five largest financial institutions in the world, um, who definitely has a a heavy investment in um, AWS as well as Azure because because of their Microsoft Enterprise licensing agreements they have with them and and everything else and office tools and, you know, all sorts of millions of dollars that they spend with them every year. As part of that, they got free uh, or not free, but um, very uh, financially affordable um, uh, compute resources on Azure. And they made, they made that work, but they spent millions of dollars and thousands of man hours with orchestration layers and, and other pieces to coordinate all of the, all of the craziness that's really required to have like active active across you know across multiple clouds i remember there was a multi-cloud module that i saw somewhere probably on this very same venue that uh i've been meaning to look into uh you know just out of curiosity as to how it works because i never really had the time to explore it deeply but uh you know, that's something that I'm going to still leave for the future uh, because for the present, uh, you know, we have to create revenue so that I can, my invoices, my unpaid invoices can be paid, which are unpaid, by the way, from two years ago. <laughs> so like, ju ju uh, just so you know, I'm working for a scrappy startup. 
Yeah, I was gonna say it looks like Vlad was raising his hand. Did you yeah, have something gonna... to, to add to that, Vlad? Vlad, yeah, I do a bunch of hybrid cloud and multi cloud and whatever hype you want. It's the companies that are running active active don't really exist. Like it's not that they're unicorns. They're unicorns that are dipped in gold and can turn their poop into gold and sparkles. It's very, 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 very rare. What happens a lot though is uh, two things. It's, hey, we have this part of our app running in AWS and this completely different part of our company running in GCP or this microservice running in Azure and this one running in uh, AWS or whatever. That is common. There are clouds that have better services for specific things or they have more resources or there are discounts or whatever. It's not the same app. That's the first common path. Common, I mean, common in the sense that it's like a common one one percent, but not wider than that. And so the gonna... second one is uh, SaaS companies, where you actually need to run where your customers are, and you might have customers running in Azure, running in GCP, running in AWS. But even in that case, you still have like the main cloud. And then from that main cloud, you, de you deploy workers or you have some communication with other clouds. It's also cell-based architectures and stuff like that. Active Active across clouds is an exceedingly rare thing because it's not only very, very, very hard to do, but it's also ridiculously expensive. As I've said, I've only heard of one engineer who was working at Twitter telling me that they were doing this. Yeah, Twitter has some apps or had some apps running in, uh, they, they had the moderation stuff running in GCP, for example. And the stuff uh, like the media stuff was running in their own data centers because uh, they don't want to pay the cloud for billing. Zoom did the same thing with uh, AWS and Oracle Cloud. Netflix does the same thing with AWS and their own hardware. And that is a super common hybrid cloud uh, workload. Like there are people that do this, but the, it's very, very, very rare. And again, active, active across clouds, the chances you're gonna see that are pretty close to zero. Not zero, but you're not gonna see it. And the investment in that is humongous. Agreed. Netflix is even a crazier one because they have their own hardware that they they co-locate at the edge of a bunch of different places so they can stream uh, so that they can stream to you as fast as possible. So like it's very likely that if you have like a Verizon Fios pop, you know, four miles from your house, that there's also like a rack of Netflix equipment in there, which is like crazy. <laughs> what do you think about how much they must have deployed everywhere? I think from a business point of view, it's brilliant how they get free co-location because it benefits the ISP. Yeah. Some of it's free. It's not all free. <laughs> it's cheaper for the ISP to pay for the electricity and rack that server than to pay for the bandwidth that it would require otherwise if they didn't do that. Can I jump in with another question? Go for it. So I wanted to ask, uh, did, did anybody implement tracing before? Uh, and how it was, and how was it before and after? And, and did anybody use a uh, honeycomb? Honeycomb, what, what, what's it called? Yeah. Uh, yep. So just, you know, uh, tracing experiences <laughs> yeah that's are you point. talking about x-ray in particular no i'm talking anything anything, anything like anybody before and after you had tracing kind of with your applications yeah uh, and what did you use and how did you like it yeah the question is also very complicated because what folks were using for tracing in 2019 is not what folks should use for tracing today. Like in 2019, open telemetry was, was it in alpha? I think it was in an alpha something and most folks couldn't use it. Uh, Honeycomb had their B lines for 
whatever language you wanted. Datadog had their own client and so on and so forth. New Relic, their own client. Now all that effort went into open telemetry and that instrumentation and a lot of people are ignoring it. Tracing is awesome to do. It's not trivial because it requires upskilling developers into running their own applications in production and actually knowing what to log and where and what the best practices are around that. And again, if you don't have developers that know how to run an app in production, that's going to be very new to them and it's going to be painful. And it does require changing and instrumenting and understanding your code. If you have a 10 million C++ application from the 90s, it's <laughs> not going to be very trivial to add good traces to it. It's like logging. How do you do good logs? Anyway, uh, traces are awesome. We now even have mature-ish ways to do uh, good sampling from for traces. Honeycomb uh, specifically has the thing that is called Oh my God, what did they call it? Uh, refinery, yes, which was one of the first uh, trace aware samplers. So for people that aren't aware, uh, traces generate events, which are basically spans like, hey, thing happened in my program, but you generate those while a workflow is happening in your code or an action is being taken. And uh, that might take a while and you have a failure that's happening 15 minutes in the <laughs> in the chain. So only then you know if you want to keep the trace or not. So what the folks at Honeycomb did to optimize the costs uh, and allow you to sample traces very nicely was build refinery, which basically holds all these traces in memory for a while and then discards the not interesting ones, like the ones that don't have errors or things like things like that. Think um, HTTP status codes like. You don't care about 200s that much, so it's fine to keep one in 100 results so you get like how your response times looks and things like that. But you very much want to keep the data for all, I don't know, 500, 503 or whatever. And But that's easy because it's a single event. With traces, it was more complex. So Honeycomb was and still is one of the... I like them because they're one of the companies that actually cared about their customers. Like if you go to Datadog and tell them, hey, we're sending you too many traces, how can we send you less? Datadog is going to be, well, we're going to give you a big invoice and a discount. Politely, go take a hike. Honeycomb was like, yeah, that's not ideal. We're going to build a sampler. Um, so that's on cost, oh, oh, uh... cost implementation. And yeah, uh, if they are implemented well, which is not easy to do, they bring a lot of power not only to developers but only to but also to everybody else in your company a common example is um support folks for example like being able to actually solve stuff themselves because a customer comes in hey the application failed i got this trace id what happened and a support engineer can actually open up the trace and see that the error message is like did not have access to file and just tell that to the customer. And that applies to product managers, to BAs, to people like that. It's bringing a lot of value to the company and it's a fundamental change and a great velocity multiplier. So yeah, do it. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna add that um, Charity Majors, who is the, the founder of Honeycomb, um, actually has tons of blog posts and really good info on tracing in general, how you should trace, what you should trace, the principles behind it, the problems about doing it at scale, et cetera. Obviously there's a spin in there about how to you how to do it and how honeycomb solves all that. But there's a lot of really, really good um, general information as well. If you kind of Google around for her, she's got tons of articles for that stuff. Yes, and, yes, that's that's how I know about uh, honeycomb from oh, um, okay. charity from yeah, Twitter. Yeah, yeah. And I'm also in contact with them, uh, and they will send me a book. They have a book observability about observability, and uh, and they say they do very little marketing for Honeycomb in the book. So let's see. Uh, thank you, thank you, Vlad. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I see somebody mentioned also Jaeger. Can can uh... yeah, I wanted to mention that. Um, I could agree with a lot a lot of what Vlad said, 
I was in a very fortunate position in DevOps with one role. Um, the team was already working, was familiar with CloudFormation and Terraform, was familiar with um, effectively doing continuous integration with um, all the way through the features. They had ephemeral environments that they could kick off when they needed to. And it was for an IoT organization. And kind of the, the reason why tracing came up was because we had uh, Bluetooth mesh devices that we uh, had our own firmware on. And we would be issuing commands all the way from somebody's phone. And we wanted to know. So you know, where does this go? Where are the where are the hangups? Because if somebody pushes a switch, why doesn't it turn on in this many seconds? So it was invaluable to figure that out. Um, I myself mostly used it. Um, and the weird part about it is we had a lot of observability solutions. Um, we had, uh, in some cases, Datadog. We had, in some cases, CloudWatch. Um, and then we also had Grafana running off of uh, ClickHouse, um, which there is like a, a weird way to accelerate it with that. Um, we we easily surpass what Whisper could do. Um, so with all of that thrown at the developers, they they lead mostly on actually trying to do stats D wherever possible. And then when they really didn't understand what was going on, then I would lean in and I would sort of assist because we found that uh, for the developers, it was enough of uh, effort to try to create a trace from scratch that usually DevOps had to get involved and help them unblock. Um, but then once the trace was there, it wasn't a big deal to use it. You could see if a SQL query was slow or if uh, an MQTT uh, uh, message wasn't being uh, subscribed to, uh, all sorts of different pieces like that. But it, it, it's invaluable when you can use it, um, but it's also very expensive both uh, in developer effort uh, and I'd say also in resources, um, because in our case, we, we could trace devices that were logging a message once a second in an organization that might have, say, 100 rooms, and each one of those rooms has maybe four or five of those devices. You know, and okay, that's once a second. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of data. Like we, we, uh, we really use Firehose like a Firehose in Kinesis. So um, we had to dial things back a lot and um, had to t uh, take care. But uh, Jaeger was great. I did throw out open telemetry on top of it for what it's worth later on, uh, around 2018, it's, I think. And it, I it think was OK. They, they've actually deprecated like the, um, the Jaeger like, client itself. And they solely rely on open telemetry now to, oh, yeah. to do their collection. They're um, and then they the just same. have the agent, yeah, that, that does all that. So, but I was gonna say that uh, the the thing there's I think there's a lot of tools to gather traces and do all of these things, but unless you're in the business of running a large enterprise that's doing these things or have a necessity to do it, like actually scaling and building building scaling and monitoring your own tracing infrastructure is actually like another production system that you have to run. Um, and oftentimes those systems are really hard to predict growth in, in capacity and, you know, all those kinds of things. So uh, my- And my they all have a terrible, ter so sorry to interrupt Matt, yeah. but they no, all no, have no. a terrible UI. Like- the... Yeah, I was gonna say that, yeah. <laughs> and um, and then, so my, my TLDR would be, find someone else to do that heavy lifting for you unless you absolutely are at the scale that you need to do it yourself. And I plus one Vlad's recommendation for Honeycomb. I've used them uh, many times and I really, really enjoy them um, over, you know, almost everything else that I've seen. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, there is also just for what it's worth. Um, there's also a Cilium and and Hubble, I mean, yes, it's it's free and probably the UI is bad, but yeah. but they have they they provide some metrics uh, without any 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 application changes without without anything. You have do not have to do anything. You just do the. I mean, that's what they say. I don't know, but no, no. I'm also I'm also leaning towards you know either open telemetry for sure. But then on top of open telemetry, either Datadog or or Honeycomb, 
I, that's what I mean. But thanks for the thanks for the input, guys. All right. Well, we are basically at time for the day. I think we'll uh, pause at this point and pick up next week, same time, same place. If you haven't already registered for our weekly office hours, go to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, cloudposse.com slash office hours to register. You'll get an invitation and uh, an event added to your calendar. We syndicate our office hours as a podcast. Go to podcast.cloudposse.com to get access to those. And then uh, if you are interested in ever connecting with Cloud Posse and seeing if we can move the needle for you at your organization, go to cloudposse.com slash quiz to book a session directly with me. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash quiz. Our YouTube channel is youtube.com slash cloud posse. Today's session will be syndicated there in a few hours. And we also have a newsletter with some of the interesting links uh, that come up through our office hour sessions there. Just go to newsletter.cloudposse.com. Thanks all. Talk to you soon.